This short talk is about Aristotle's concept of eudaimonia. So, eu is the prefix to this word. It's e-u-d-a-i-m-o-n-i-a -I -I is the word. So, the prefix eu means happy. Think of the beginning to euthanasia. It means happy death, euthanasia. I don't know if you're aware of that. But it means happy or blessed. Daimon sounds a lot like our word demon, and it actually comes from the same root. But it means spirit as opposed to demon. And ia means a state of being. In the Greek, that suffix means that. So it literally, by its etymology, means happy spirit state of being. And we're going to see what, what on earth is that. That's a strange uh, description, but that's pretty good description, really, of what he means. So as usual, we have the archery motif and the idea of the targets. And we're dealing with virtue ethics still, with Aristotle. Now, Aristotle comes under this category to the right. Eventually, you're going to be able to fill in all of these blanks and know them by memory. They will be on your midterm. They'll be on future quizzes. And so what belongs in these blocks? Well, we started with utilitarianism, then we went to deontology, and now we're at virtue ethics. And so you can see them. Ethics of conduct on the left. Utilitarianism begins with looking towards the outcomes and tries to do things based on what will they ultimately produce. Produce Deontology starts with the act itself and says, what is my duty? What do I owe to others? What ought I to do if I have a good will and if I'm operating on the basis of the categorical imperatives? When we deal with ethics of character, we're dealing with virtue ethics, and we're dealing with the idea not of doing but of being, so that one is thinking in terms of what does it look like in this situation for me to be a woman, for me to be a man of virtue. That's what we're talking about. Okay, so we in the previous video, you saw the idea of hitting the mark, unpacked further, and the idea of ends versus means. What is the end of ends? What's the ultimate end for, you, you and I might say, happiness or pleasure or love or contentment? Because those things are ends in themselves as well. Well, pleasure not so much, but happiness, a little bit more well-rounded, is an end in itself. What is the end of ends? He says that it is eudaimonia. And so this is his word, happiness. You know that Mill used happiness, and, and also um, here we're seeing the word happiness. But they have very different meanings. This is not Mill's robust idea of uh, pleasure over pain or utility, and then having it be that it would be not just sensual, but also it would be intellectual and aesthetic. It's not that. For him, happiness here means a state of being. A state of being. If you think about our word happiness, it has as its root hap, or happenstance. You think about happenstance. That has to do with what happens to you. But that is not what is in view when we're talking about eudaimonia. This is about what you do with your life and a state of being that you build. Okay, so eudaimonia. What Aristotle says is desire is to good as belief is to truth. We want to desire our true good just like we want to believe what is true. So, for him, eudaimonia, it depends on how good you actually are, whether or not you achieve this state. Do you consistently live as an ethical woman or man of character? It happens by choice, not by chance. It has to do with the orientation of your life. Are you continuously making wise choices and living as a woman or a man of character? And it's lasting and not temporary. Remember the, the first thought experiment, right? The discussion at the beginning of the class? When you're 80 years old and you're looking back on your life, how will you know whether you lived a, a good life or a bad life? This is something that is lasting. It's something that you would have when you're older and say, I've had a blessed life. I've had a blessed or a happy spirit state of being. So he's talking about precision here. And he says it is the mark of an educated man, educated person that means, not male. So it's the mark of an educated man to look for precision in each class of things just so far as the nature of the subject admits. It's evidently equally foolish to accept probable reasoning from a mathematician. We want them to tell us what the numbers actually are. And to demand from a rhetorician scientific proofs. The first discipline is one that has a lot of specificity and certainty to it. And the second one is a lot a kind of fuzzy. And so for us to ask the one that's known for specificity for it to be that it can be fuzzy, or for us to ask the one that is kind of fuzzy for it to be specific, that's unwise. So he's saying that somewhere, when he's saying this, somewhere on the continuum between the fuzziness of rhetoric and the specificity of mathematics, 
false ethics, false moral philosophy. And there's a degree of certainty that we can have, but not as much as we have with mathematics. So he puts forward some candidates for what exactly happiness is. The first one that he brings up is pleasure, because, well, he's dealing in a world where he has Epicurus, and he's got before him Aristippus. He's got the hedonists. And he, he brings up pleasure, and he eliminates that one. Then he brings up honor, and he says that couldn't really be happiness because you're dependent for, for this thing upon other people. And it would seem that if you're going to have a state of being of, of eudaimonia, it would be within yourself and not elsewhere. This third one may seem odd to you. In, in the ancient world, this was something that was very much desired, that somebody would have the, the, the means, the, the wealth, to be able to engage in contemplation, to do a lot of deep thinking. Okay? And so he, he eliminates that one because there's only so many people who would be able to engage in that, and yet he thinks that eudaimonia is something that the common man or woman could achieve. So pleasure, everybody wants it, but it can't be the highest human good because animals also have pleasure. Remember the statement by Carlyle about Bentham, that Bentham's ple uh, happiness is, a, you know, a pig's happiness. Honor depends on those who bestow it, and we want it in order to know that we have worth. And then contemplation is a higher happiness, but it's one which few people really pursue or actually can pursue. So going on here, he says, clearly the virtue we must study is human virtue, for the good we were seeking was human good and the happiness human happiness. By human virtue, we mean not that of the body, but that of the soul. Like, Arist like, excuse me, like Socrates, he thinks there's more to you than just your body. And happiness also we can call an activity of soul or of the whole person. He's a lot more holistic than Plato or Socrates in his thought process. So he thinks of your soul as being your you, your whole being. He goes on, he says, but if this is so, clearly the student of politics, by this he doesn't mean, you know, Democrats and Republicans, elephants and donkeys. He means those who study human relationships, is the way he's using this word. Polis is the people in Greek, in, in, in Greek language. So the stu clearly the student of politics must know something about the facts about the soul, about human beings. As the man who is to heal the eyes of the body as a whole must know about the eyes of the body. A doctor's got to study anatomy. And all the more since politics is more prized and better than medicine. His world was different than ours. But even among doctor, doctors, the best educated spend much labor on acquiring, acquiring knowledge of the body. So he thinks you need to know about humans in, in relationship with other humans. You need to know something of human nature in order to really get at eudaimonia. In virtue ethics, we really need to know something of human nature if we're going to be able to identify the moral good for humans. That's the idea. So he goes on to say, the student of politics then must study the soul and must study it with these objects in view and do so just to the extent which is sufficient for the question we are discussing. For further precision, remember it's the mark of a wise person to, to know how much precision fits the particular discipline. For further precision is perhaps something more laborious than our purposes require. So regarding virtue ethics and its close relations, Think of Iris Murdoch and Martha Nussbaum, Mary Midgley, Nell Noddings. I've made mention of some of these ladies already. There's an emphasis on the fact that the nature of the human organism, human beings, and what makes for the human organism's well-being have to enter into our determination of values. If you want to know what moral or ethical good is, you need to know what's good for human beings. Anscombe, Elizabeth Anscombe, Philippa Foote, and others believed that this needed to be affirmed because the philosophers, prior to them coming on the scene, mostly all male, and if you've read uh, the piece that I wrote on Anscombe, you know that they were off at war, the men were off at war in, in the Second World War, and this is when the women rose to prominence at Oxford. The men had made a divorce between facts and values, which was not a helpful move. Hume is the one who was believed to have conclusively argued this, but as you've seen already, Hume didn't say that. All that Hume actually said was that um, you couldn't get from facts to values without bringing sentiment or emotion into the equation. So if we're going to be able to have eudaimonia, a blessed state of being, we've got to know human nature. We've got to understand what makes for human thriving. So what makes us fully happy and fully human? According to Aristotle, it's for us living according to reason. You have to make human beings your study, and what makes human beings contented your study in order to live according to reason. He says that good is an activity of the soul in accordance with virtue in a complete life. He says something interesting, and this is called 
by some Aristotelian luck. He says that you can't only, there, there, there's certain lives in which eudaimonia does not occur, but not because the person isn't living virtuously. So this seems counterintuitive, that if I lived a good life and I'm being a virtuous woman or a virtuous man, I should be able to attain the state of eudaimonia. But he thinks that if, if too much ill or too much evil or too much bad fortune befalls a person, that could steal away eudaimonia. So what he says is, now many events happen by chance and events differing in importance. Small pieces of good fortune or its opposite clearly do not weigh down the scales of life one way or the other. But a multitude of greater, of, of greater events, if they turn out well, will make life happier. Whereas, well, he says, for not only are they themselves such as to add beauty to life, but the way a man deals with them may be noble and good. While if these events turn out ill, they crush and maim happiness. If I have too much tragedy in my life, even if I've been a virtuous man or a virtuous woman, I'm not going to have the state of eudaimonia because it will take away, it snatch away the blessed state of being that I'm looking for. It says they both bring pain with them and they hinder many activities. So the effect could be that you have just had a bad hand of cards dealt to you, kind of, so to speak. So he speaks about this, though, and he, he speaks about this with regard to people who are people of character. Yet even in these, nobility shines through when a man, when a woman bears with resignation many great fis misfortunes, not through insensibility to pain, but through, through nobility and greatness of soul. And he uses the uh, character of King Priam of Troy, who is a, a good king, who loses his son uh, Achilles, not Achilles, he loses his son Hector to Achilles, outside the gates of his city, and of course, by way of the Trojan horse, he has his city destroyed, and he has his foolish son, who's really brought about the Trojan War, is who ultimately the kingdom is going to be left to. So King Priam is not a happy man. He's not a man with a blessed state of being, even though he has been a good man. So Aristotle is saying, we, we search for eudaimonia, we make that our pursuit, but sometimes there are things in our lives that we can't control that might keep us from having it fully. That's the end of that talk.